Hello, hello, hello. Hello, everyone. We are here. We are ready. We're ready to rock and roll. Are you ready, sweetheart? So ready. I'm so pumped up about the content we're going to be sharing today because we're going to help some people in their marriage situations. And that's what it's all about. Especially those who have broken situations. Mm. Uh, and it's just like, man, they feel like I don't know what to do with my relationship. Our hope is to be used as tools of God today to share some principles that can help rescue broken marriages. Hey, welcome to our podcast today, guys. Thank you for tuning in to Doing Life with Ken and Tabitha. We have been married for 24 years, all right? It's been the best 22 years of our life. The first two years um, was horrible. Um, I was mean and selfish and prideful, and you were, what were you? I was depressed. I was sad and just trying to get through life. She had been diagnosed depressed when we met for 10 years of her life at that point and kind of been through everything growing Mm -hmm. up from um, sexual abuse and verbal abuse and really didn't grow up um, in a home where you saw a husband and a wife. And so us getting married, you come from that. And I just came from, um, you know, my parents are uh, are still married today and going strong, but I was honestly just selfish Mm -hmm. and I was immature and marriage is for mature people. It's not for immature people that are not willing to put in the work. And so if you're newer to our broadcast, let me just say welcome. Man, I don't believe you're watching this by accident. We pray and we say, God, would you please send people to find our podcast around the world that you really want to connect with us, that we can do life with them. And our goal is to share with you guys our highs, but more importantly, our lows. And hopefully between our highs and lows, you can extract some principles to help you grow closer to God and closer to the people that you love in your life. And so if you're newer to our podcast, um, you can hit the subscribe button. If you're on YouTube, hit the download button on podcast, wherever you're watching this. And uh, make sure that you let us know if this is a blessing to you. Today's topic is a good one. And mm. I kind of want to jump right in it because I don't want to waste any time today. Um, I want there to be healing in the words. Amen. Um, today is five keys to saving a broken marriage. Okay. And I believe the reason that someone has clicked on this this is because there is something happening in their marriage or in the marriage of a person that they know or are friends with that is heading the wrong way. They're trending down yeah. and they're like, oh, my God, I need help. I don't know what to do. I feel lost. Um, let me just start right there. Has there ever been a time in our marriage, 24 years, where you felt lost or you felt like, I don't know if this marriage is going to make it or it was in a bad place. Can you just kind of share with uh, people where we were and Mm -hmm. what we've been through? I mean, well, yeah, in the beginning of our marriage, uh, we got married. I I was 23, you were 21. We got married in our senior year of college and graduated college. And, you know, it was uh, really hard for us. Mm -hmm. Um, I think at the time, uh, like we said, I was depressed. Mm -hmm. I was diagnosed um, with severe depression and anxiety disorder. And I just thought that this was something that I had to deal with in my life. I didn't Mm -hmm. think is anything that you can get over and you can get healed from. Mm -hmm. God healed me. Uh I've been depression free for maybe over 20 years now. Uh But in the moment, I was depressed and um, I was just trying to get through life and figure out life. So a lot Uh of um, the problems that we went through um, were loud and vivid to you. But Uh I was kind of like just sleeping it away. Uh I would wake up, go to work, Uh come back home, go to sleep Uh kind of thing. Um, And I remember when um, Uh we, you know, we, we first um, well, we went to church. I got say I, I got filled with the Holy Spirit. Began declaring the Word of God over my life, and literally, God healed me of depression. Yeah. And in that time, there was a, a period of time where it was almost like the blindfolds were removed from my eyes, and right. I woke up and I was like in this marriage. Uh-huh. And I remember looking at you and being like, "Why is he so mad at me? Mm-hmm. You know, why is he so mean? Mm-hmm. Wh- you know, what what is going on here?" Mm-hmm. And from that moment, mm-hmm. I had to begin to pick up the pieces, mm-hmm. you know, of our marriage. Mm-hmm. and begin to work on our marriage? Yeah, for me, I, I believed in God, mm-hmm. um, but I lived as a Christian atheist for about 10 years uh, or a little bit more. Um, I define that as a person who believes in God but lives like he does, doesn't exist. Mm-hmm. So even though I believed in a God or I believed in God, you couldn't see it in my lifestyle. So mm-hmm. I didn't really have a church that I belonged to. I didn't really have mentors, that, I, but I did believe in God. Mm-hmm. And so one thing that God did is that I remember him telling me that we would get married before I, we even met. So I would see you on college campuses, and I was like, listen, this is going to be my wife, okay? I remember after we got married, I didn't know how to live right, and so we wasn't living sexually pure. We were just doing everything that everybody else was doing, you know? And so we, I felt bad about that. Um, it, before, you wasn't even saved. 
saved. You got saved. And then there was a conviction that I had. And then I had this conviction of like, you know what? We need to get married. Mm -hmm. And so we got married at 21 years old. Now I'm 45 and you're 47. We've been married for 24 years. But I had a relationship with God, but it was like a pseudo relationship with God. It was, I was just a Christian atheist. So the first two years of our marriage, we went to church, but we didn't have a church home. We owned a Bible, but I didn't read it. Um, I, I believed in God, but I didn't know how to live for him. And so from your battle with depression, I remember even, um, I think, dating in the first year, we would go to some um, therapy sessions together mm-hmm. as you was overcoming depression. Mm-hmm. But because I didn't have the right surroundings, like all of my friends were single, I still thought like a single man. Mm-hmm. And then I was irritated. I felt like um, you were holding me back. Mm-hmm. I felt like I could um, do better without you Um, because of your depression back then you were failing out of school Mm -hmm. and I was like going through school really fast because you're two years older than me. And I was like, man, you done been here before I got here and I'm going to leave before you even get out. Matter of fact, when we went to get our college degrees, um, we, you had failed a class and we thought that you wasn't even going to get a degree. So you had your graduation attire on. And in my mind, I was mad. I was like, she ain't getting a degree. She's going to go in there and they're going to say, you don't have a degree. And I'm out of here. I'm leaving West Virginia. I'm going to move somewhere without you. And listen, I knew it. Uh And I was a new believer and I was young in my faith, but Uh I did know enough to just pray and ask God Uh for like, seriously to ask God that I would graduate so that my husband wouldn't leave me here in West Virginia. you yeah. failed the class, and what did God do? You went to your graduation. I failed the class. Shouldn't have. I failed the class. Uh-huh. I shouldn't have had the credits to graduate. Mm-hmm. But I had the credits to graduate, yeah. and I and graduated. It's too late now to take it back, and it can't take it back. <laughs> I have my diploma. It's a degree, and so <laughs> my degree. You, and so you went to the tent to get your degree or diploma, whatever it is. And they say, what's the your name? piece of paper. And you say, Tabitha Clater. The woman reached in there and pulled out your yes, she did. papers. Yes, she that did. That was a miracle. Mm-hmm. But our God is in a miracle working mm-hmm. business. Mm-hmm. Meaning that even if we aren't perfect and we do things our way, his hand is still on us. Mm-hmm. And what I found out a lot about the Lord is that he's just looking for humble people. Yeah. People that will trust him more than we trust ourselves. And I feel like the people who are watching today is watching or listening because they're those kind of people. They're life learners. They're just like, God, I need some help. Yes. And hopefully um, we can give them some help today. And so for the first two years, I was that kind of guy that would like still go out to the club or go out partying with my friends, take my wedding band off and just go out and act like I wasn't married. Um, I would fool around with other women. I wouldn't take it all the way to penetration or nothing like that, but I would fool around. So you can just call that infidelity and unfaithfulness. I didn't take it all the way there, but I, I took it further than where it should be. And because I didn't know how to be a married man. Mm -hmm. I didn't know how to be a husband. Mm -hmm. I didn't know how to deal with your situation that you were going through. But on the inside, what I felt was more like anger. Mm -hmm. I felt frustrated that I got married so young and now you won't even get up and go, you know what I'm saying? It wasn't like I married you and your daddy had a bunch of money and he bought us a car for our wedding and and, and you pay for the whole wedding or none of that. It it was more like, um, I wasn't thinking like, what have I done? It was more just like, flesh and maturity and over focus on me and me not even seeing you of who you would be today. Now, thank God I knew enough just to stick it out. Mm -hmm. Matter of fact, I called my dad one time and my dad's been married. I don't know over 40 years, 43, 44 years, maybe. But I called him um, when I first got married and I said, dad, I'm thinking about getting a divorce. And I said, she don't do this and she don't do that. And she Mm -hmm. don't do this. And my dad said, so And that's all he said, because one word that has an anointing on it can change your complete direction. Yeah. And that's the man. ain't never gave me no more counsel about my marriage ever. But he (laughs) said this one. He said, so like, so what? You know, marriage is till death do you part. So what? She don't cook. She don't clean. She don't get up out of the bed. So what? You go in there and you lead her. He didn't have to say any of that. He just said, so Mm -hmm. like, why don't you grow up? And I think there's somebody who's thinking about leaving their spouse and you got this long laundry list of things that they don't do. Mm -hmm. And the prophetic word from us to you would be so what Mm. the two have become one. If you dump on them, you are dumping on yourself. Come on. And so when I got the realization of this team, Clayta, and my job is to, the captain on this team is to lead us into the championship. So, okay, we're going to deal with depression together. We're going to yes. deal with these things yes. together. And we're going to invite God in. Yeah. And and, and I think, um, you know, usually, you, so, so like in our instance, 
Um, you know, I got saved. We got married. I had enough like, you know, you married the, the person that you married, you know, when you married me, I was alive and just, you know, and, you know, I was you knew that I was depressed. You knew what I was up against, but it was almost like I, I had was in this up cycle of like, you know, everything was great in life, but with depression for me, it was like, it would be great, but then it would go all go down uh -huh. and then I'd work really hard and get it great again. And it would all go back down. Oh, wow. I was stuck in this negative cycle. And so when we got married, we were, I was in the high point of the cycle, uh -huh. but then a little bit, you know, six months into marriage, I started to dip down again uh -huh. and you were a part of that process. And I don't even, blame you for wanting to feel like, oh my gosh, what is going on? This isn't even who I married, you know, yeah. what is happening in her life. But I will say I would never have overcome that if we hadn't learned the principles of God. Yeah. Um, and 100%. You, you know, really, um, I, because, you know, I got saved. I didn't even know that you could be healed of depression. Like right. I didn't know that God was a healer. I knew not, not a lot at all about the Bible. Uh -huh. And the more I learned the word of God and the principles of God, I just began to apply them to my life. Mm -hmm. And our relationship began to get better when I got filled with the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And I, when I got healed of depression, mm -hmm. then I was able with a sound mind to look around and see like, okay, I know what I'm working with here. Mm -hmm. And that's when we started going um, mm -hmm. I guess uh, our marriage started to improve at that point. Well, there was things, and this is what's happening for somebody even now, is that it was almost like a compounding effect of a bunch of things at the mm -hmm. same time. You got filled with the Holy Spirit at the same time. I got filled with the Holy Spirit at the same yes. time that God got us to a church. And he connected we us to a church the where the lead pastor and his wife led kind of like we do. Mm -hmm. And we had an example of marriage. And they actually have and still have to this day a marriage ministry. Mm -hmm. So every um, first Friday, um, we would have marriage ministry. So we had this example. We had marriage principles. We had an atmosphere of other healthy married couples. Mm -hmm. You were free from depression. We had the power of God on our life. And it was like over a span of like, it seemed like what, three months. Yeah. We made a divine turnaround from like divorce to, okay, let's fight together mm -hmm. and this is how we do it. To best friends, to understanding date nights, to understanding delegation of responsibility, to understanding how to communicate, to understanding his yeah. needs, her needs, to understanding the division of money, to understanding how to get a family constitution, to understanding how yeah. no everybody knows where everybody goes. I mean, I'm talking about principle after principle after principle after principle. I guess I say that. People who are listening, they listen to the right, yeah. the right thing. Well, a lot of marriages uh -huh. are challenged and failing or broken because mm -hmm. they just don't have the information. Yeah. They just don't have the tools. They right. just don't know what the Bible says right. um, about marriage. And once you, I mean, I'm telling you, mm -hmm. you ate it up. Yeah. Once you decide. Well, and that's the thing, because mm -hmm. there are people who has this information, but their marriage is still not good because they hear something, but they don't. They're not they're doing either, it. They don't go home and apply it mm -hmm. or they don't really know how to apply mm -hmm. it. And yeah. that's the conversation that I really want to have. I'm okay. telling you now, yeah. there's people that their marriage should be further along and they got they got this, but they don't know what to do with it when What's they go the home. application? They don't know. I feel tired. What do I do with that? Mm -hmm. She's not listening. What do I do with that? He's watching, um, playing video games. What do I do with that? And so I just want, let's help a little bit today. Let's help. Five keys to saving a broken marriage. All right. Five keys to mm -hmm. saving a broken marriage. Okay. Now here's the thing. First off, we believe any marriage can be saved. Yeah. We do. We don't care how bad it is. We've mm -hmm. seen people actually get divorced from each other twice mm -hmm. and get remarried, get remarried to one another on the third time. You know, mm -hmm. so there's nothing too hard for the Lord. Mm -hmm. doesn't matter how bad your situation is. All things are possible to them that believe. Mm -hmm. Now you got to do a bunch of deep work. You might have to do a bunch of forgiveness. There might have been infidelity. There might have been all kinds of things. I've seen people rebound and come back from all of it. But you're going to have to be willing to forgive. You're going to have to be willing to go to counseling. You're going to have to be willing to take the low road to turn the other cheek. But we're going to be here to do it with you. So number one, five keys to saving a broken marriage is number one, you got to locate where you are. Mm. The law of destination, it starts with location. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, you go into a mall, you got to see the dot that says you are here. Before mm -hmm. you get to Macy's, you got to figure out where you are. Yeah. So you got to figure out where you are. So my question for the people who are, who are tuning in today is where are you in your marriage? Where are you? Not just your marriage. Your marriage on a scale of one to 10, you might say collectively it's a five, but where are you mm -hmm. as a husband and where are you as a wife? Mm, because that's when good. you understand where you are, then you can say, I am here, but I want to be here. I yeah. want to be at a different place. Then and only then can you begin to create a strategy to get to where you want to go. 
Mm-hmm. I think that's good. And that's good for both the, the husband and the wife mm-hmm. to locate yourself, you know, on a scale of one to 10, mm-hmm. you know, where am I and where do I want to get to? And, but then the marriage, you know, overall, right. um, so that you can both be on the same page, right. uh, working toward these goals. Uh-huh. And sometimes, I mean, it, in the beginning when it's broken, it might be, you know, you're on, maybe one has more growing to do than the other, yeah. you know, and that's, that's okay. okay. But mm-hmm. the important thing is to, is to locate yourself. Locate where you are. So here's the question is to locate you. Um, Do you know what a good marriage looks like? Mm. Do you have a model of a good marriage? Because many times we need a model. Okay. Um, Where are you in your marriage on a scale of one to 10, 10 being perfect, one being horrible, rate yourself. So if you're a five, what do you want to be? Do you Mm want to be an eight? Do you want to be a nine? Okay. Um, What does it mean? Write this down. What does it mean to be a good husband? Write that down. What does it mean to be a good husband? What does that look like to you? Mm -hmm. I couldn't define that. What does it mean to be a good wife? Okay. What do you aspire to be? Okay. I want you to define what a husband is biblically. Define what a wife is mm-hmm. biblically. All right. I want you to chart out a plan to get there. Okay. So you are a four, but you want to be at an eight. How do you close that gap? Mm-hmm. What do we have to do? And it's not going to happen overnight, but this is what I will do. So I got a goal. And then every day I'm going to take steps towards that goal. Okay. You got to stop the bleeding. You got to remove the things that are killing the marriage. Yeah. Now there's some things that are marriage killers. Um, they are so toxic that you cannot really get restored in your marriage with these things still being there. Yeah. For example, addictions, addictions. they have to go. Abuse cannot be there. Mm-hmm. Infidelity has to stop. Pornography has to be shut down. Lying. Lying is the one that people don't talk about a lot. Yeah. But you cannot build. Um, all marriages are built around trust. And if you lie, I can't trust you. Like, I mean, come on now. Like, even with your kids. Like, my kids, they can do anything, and I'm going to be there for them. Mm-hmm. But it's going to be hard if they lie to me. Mm-hmm. Like, if it's one thing I don't want them, don't lie to me. Because then yeah. I, we don't have nothing. Yeah. Like, look, you, you drunk at 2 a.m.? Call me. I'll come pick you up. I don't like it. We'll deal with it later. But don't you lie to me. Don't mm-hmm. come in the house and act like you wasn't doing something you did. Because then we don't have nothing. Right. And I think we need to go back, and we just need to get that truthful heart again. Anything on that? I agree. Okay. Number two, my second um uh, key for you to saving a broken marriage would be work on your own personal growth. Mm. Okay. Because marriage is the sum of two different people coming together. So we are the claters and it's the sum of us coming together. Yeah. Um, if one person is immature, the whole sum of our averages goes <laughs> down. So if you're fleshy and you stay out all night and drink and sleep, well, you bring the whole clay to crew down to that yeah. level. And um, it's called, John Maxwell will call it the law of the lid. Mm. So you got to be careful who you marry because you come under the lid of kind of where they are. All right. And so we are not saying stop working on your marriage to work on you. Now, I've heard that before. Well, I'm just, I got to work on me right now. And I got to work on my mental health and I got to work on my emotion. Listen, if you are married, you have to work on you and your marriage at the same time. You cannot put your marriage on the back burner and say, I'll get to that when I'm healthy. It ain't worked that way. You shouldn't have said I do. You're going to have to be, (laughs) you're going to have to be, what is it? Um, Multi- multifaceted, multitask. Yeah, I don't even, I don't get that expression because I don't know how you can not work on your marriage if you're working on you. And I don't know how you can separate working I'm on telling you, you what and working somebody, on your marriage. Well, like it's all together. How do you separate it? is hanging on by a thread if it's even still together today because the spouse decided that she needed, she has some mental health issues and her counselor told her she needed to get herself together before she could do anything with the marriage. So for years, this man has been on the side and she's sought nothing about the marriage but trying to get herself together. That's crazy. Yeah. It's bad advice. It's horrible. Yeah. It's it's not, it's not God. It's just not. Okay. And so anyway, um, you got to work on your own personal Mm -hmm. growth. Now what I've noticed in our marriage Mm -hmm. is that you grow you. Yeah. And I grow me too. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we outgrow each other. Sometimes I see you mm-hmm. getting ahead. I say, oh, no, 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 I'm going to come get yeah. you. Yeah. And then I go and I can start growing. And you're like, oh, no, no, no. Mm-hmm. And so that's what we should have. And I think that in our, we've grown together. Yeah. And I would really encourage couples to grow together. Like go to church together. Read books together. Like grow together. Don't mm-hmm. leave each other behind. Mm-hmm. But I think if I can grow as a human being, it affects my marriage. Yeah. If I can grow in me just being a kinder person, it affects my marriage. If I can grow in just being a person who keeps my word, it affects my marriage. If I can grow with not being so selfish, but selfless, it affects my marriage. Like if I can just grow me, mm-hmm. 
You know, I tell leaders all the time, if you want to grow your grow your church, you got to grow yourself. Mm -hmm. But if you want to grow your marriage, you got to grow yourself, too. Absolutely. And I think it's, (laughs) you know, as um, I think it's encouraging when we see each other Mm -hmm. growing. Mm -hmm. It encourages me when I see you growing closer to the Lord, when I see you growing in your leadership, Uh when I see you growing as a parent, you know, when I see you exercising, you know, it inspires me and it makes me want to come and, you know, match where you are like, oh, I see where you're going. I got you. You know, here we go. Let's go. And so I think, you know, that's in a marriage, it iron sharpens iron um, that we can really help one another and inspire one another. But here's my question you were frustrated when you were 22 <clears throat> why you still love frustrated at 42 yeah you know what i'm saying like no you were uh, you were judgmental at 23 yeah why are you still judgmental at 53 yeah like, well, like in you, marriage, we have to take responsibility for our own growth. And that's what you're talking about here. Like we have to work on ourselves, yeah. not exclusive from each other. This is what I know. My pastor used to say it takes two fools to fight. Most of the time, it's two people, and each person has a part to play mm-hmm. in the demise of the relationship. Mm-hmm. Every once in a while, you have some joker that's just out there and got a good thing at home. She got a good thing. He got a good thing at home, and they just just, just wrong. Mess it all up. But most of the time, it's 70, 30, 60, 40, 50, 50, yeah. 90, 10. I got a part to play. You got a part yeah. to play. What I cannot do is play your part. Right. I cannot make you grow. I can only grow myself. Mm-hmm. And so many marriages get into this fight because I want you to do this and I want you to do that. But you can't change them. Only God can change them. The only person I can change is me. And what if you took this as a word that, listen, even if you don't change, I'm going to change enough for both of us where I've had such an eclipse in my life that it's going to affect your life by the run over. I think it's, you know, so what I'm saying is like there's certain attitudes like you've been a nag for 20 years. You've been prejudiced for, for 35 years. You've been you've been untrusting and jealous. When are you going to deal with that? Yeah. Because that's affecting. The, so you got to locate yourself. Then you got to grow yourself. Right. Number three, I would say you got to die to self. Mm-hmm. And this is a huge one because one of the greatest enemies to marriage is selfishness. It's me, 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 me. I want this and I want that and I want this and I want that and I want this. You probably and I want shouldn't that. get married if you're a selfish person. Great day. Um, one of the attributes of turning a bad marriage around is selflessness, mm-hmm. your ability to focus on your spouse more than you. What happens to the marriage? I call it a bless me contest where it's like all I can think about is meeting your needs mm-hmm. and all you think about is meeting my needs. Mm-hmm. Great marriage. Bad marriage. All I can think about is you meet my needs and all you can think about is me meeting your needs. Bad marriage. Great marriage is all I can think about is meeting your needs. And all you, it's so simple, but it's so profound. Yeah. So a great marriage is built on, I want your dreams to come to pass. When we get into bed, I want you to be pleased. I want you to climax. I want to meet your needs. Mm-hmm. I want you to have the best car. I want you to have the best spot in the bed. I want you to have clothes before I buy clothes. I want to make sure that you feel good, you know? Yeah. And in turn, you do what? I want to make sure that you have all of these things. You're supposed things. to put your, your your hand on my shoulder. Like oh, that. really? Yeah. And I'm uh-huh. supposed to rub your yes, give you a little me, massage like this. Yes. Oh, that's actually good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but this is here. Well, this is what I was really gonna say. <laughs> was you know we often like in before. Okay, so we're in the marriage, but before we even get marriage, uh-huh. I think we're also set up for failure because it's like, well, I want to marry him because he makes me happy and he does this for me and he does that for me mm. and all of those things and. We have the list of who we want and who our wife's going to be and who our husband's going to be because of all the things that they do for us. And we're going to spend our lives happily (laughs) ever after and all that stuff when it should be the opposite in like, no, I want to marry him because I just want to be with him for the rest of his life. Every day that he wakes up, I want to be next to him. I want to be the one that makes him happy. Mm. I want to be the one that serves him. I I want to share my life with him. I was going to say, let's take it higher. Yeah. I want I want to serve him. Yeah. I want to serve him. You know, uh, and, and maybe that makes a woman's flesh scream, you're not ready. Yeah. I, I remember when Sarah called Abraham Lord. Mm. It, you know, I don't, I don't know the original meaning of the word, but she called him Lord. Mm-hmm. And I'm not saying that you need to call your husband Lord or your, your, your wife Lord. But what I'm saying is that there's just something about um, two people that are bent on serving each other. God, absolutely. That is much better than two people bent on 
being served? Well, you know, Jesus is the greatest servant of all. Mm -hmm. And I think like for me, like I'm a servant. Yeah. I'm a, as a pastor, if I'm up on stage preaching messages, servant. I'm not a superstar. Right. I'm a servant. I am serving these 500, 1,000, 10,000 people in the, I am serving. I serve my children. Right. I serve anyone. If I sit down and have a conversation with you and I'm helping you in any way, I am serving you. Right. And so, yes, I'm going to serve my husband. I mean, hopefully you're not married to an idiot. If you're married to an idiot, you can start serving them and they're just going to take advantage of you. But my guess is that most people aren't married to an idiot. Yeah. And that if you start serving them, they're going to be like, Okay, okay, let me let me go in and help her. Mm -hmm. Let me go in and help him. Mm -hmm. I know that's how it was for us. I think you kind of started the trend of being the hero in the home mm -hmm. and you started doing things to um like fix me dinner, take care of my clothes, and even though I was mad and angry and I treated you bad, I couldn't stay there mm -hmm. because you were displaying something. You just came jujitsu style. You just came with Kung Fu. Like you came in a different way. Like it's one thing if you wanted to yell at me too yeah. and take your ring off and go out to the club and act like you wasn't married and tick for tat. Okay. You was cheating on me. I'm going to cheat on you. But instead you went jujitsu on me. You went, you went ninja on me and you started to say, okay, if you want to go out, go out. I'll be here when you get back. Or like, um, uh, I'm going to serve you. I'm going to love you. I'm going to make your favorite foods. We're going to have Ken's night. Okay. You didn't come home for dinner. I wrapped it up. I put it in the refrigerator for you whenever you want it go ahead and eat it that is literally overcoming evil with good and the bible says that when you over when you do good mm -hmm. when people are doing evil it's like dumping coals of fire on their head yes, sir. and at a point i was like oh my god i gotta treat this woman better all i was doing was accessing the word of god and uh -huh. the principles of god yeah. because i got saved but i didn't know the word of god was my weapon uh -huh. i didn't know the word of god was the instruction manual for my life all i know is that three people came to my door they showed me the bible they told me that jesus loved me i believed them uh -huh. i read the bible i knew that jesus saved me and i wanted to give my life to him and i did i changed a lot of things in my life stop drinking and you know doing like a lot of things that I used to do before I got saved. Um, but I just didn't, I, I didn't know anything. Mm -hmm. But the moment I was presented with the, the word of God, mm -hmm. like I got my weapons, I got my sword, yeah. I got my shield mm -hmm. and I started using it like I'm a fighter. Okay, well, let's get real practical then. Let's just stop for a moment. Um, so our marriage was bad mm -hmm. and I was being ignorant. Mm -hmm. Give women a few things and men Give us a few things that you did to try to win me. Mm -hmm. um, I just started to always just to love you and not get in like the, the tit for tat, you know, like we do. And so, for example, um, well, first of all, I did this. I realized like we said, I located our, myself. I realized that I was in a bad place with you. I realized that our marriage was in a bad place and I wanted it to be better. And I realized my part, mm -hmm. the part that I had to play. Mm -hmm. I knew that I had been depressed for the last two years of our marriage. And I knew that I didn't give you the best of me. Mm -hmm. And I knew that I didn't even know what the best of me was at that point. I was still discovering it. Mm -hmm. But I knew to go to God and trust God mm -hmm. with everything that I had. Mm -hmm. And so I laid down my pride mm -hmm. and I said, okay, uh, I I'm not going to argue with them. I'm not going to have a comeback. I'm not going to do any of that stuff. I'm just going to trust you, God. And so as situations arrive, <laughs> came, I just handled it through the help of the Holy Spirit. Like you cross that bridge when you get to it. Sometimes we go, oh, I can't do it because what am I going to do if he says this and he does that? Well, no, just, just take one step at a time. <laughs> so, you know, like maybe the first step was like, um, all right, um, I'm making dinner for you. You don't, you don't want to talk to me. Okay, well, um, I made dinner for you. Oh, you're not coming home so day I would after do day after like, day? Um, she would make dinner and I would eat out on purpose so I didn't have to eat what she made. Mm -hmm. Like ornery mean stuff like that. How did you take that? I just, I would make <laughs> your food. I wrapped it up. I put Ken with a little heart on it and I stuck it in the refrigerator. And if you didn't eat it, I'd take it out, throw it away. And I would still keep making your meals without being offended. Um, there were times where, um, I remember, you know, like our sex life was, was terrible and I wanted to, I wanted you to like me. I wanted you to be attracted to me. I wanted you to like, you know, what'd you do? I, I, 
went upstairs and put on some really like sexy clothes and I came down while you were watching the game and maybe that was a mistake while you were watching the game. But I came down and I, you know, just was, you know, wanted to entice you and, and dance before you and, you know, do anything romantic. So you was trying to give me a lap dance and I was trying to watch the game. And so you tried to get on my lap and I kind of moved you off. Oops, sorry, microphone. I tried to move you off of my lap. Mm -hmm. Move, microphone. Move Basically, you, off my you lap. rejected me. Yeah. And you rejected you me. And I was just like, okay, you mm -hmm. know, I'll let you watch the game. Mm -hmm. And I went up to my room mean, and I, I know, cried mean. in my room. And then what you did. And um, the next day I came back down again <laughs> exactly. in my same clothes. <laughs> and you were sitting there because at this time, at this point, I got you to the point where you would come home and eat my dinner. Right. Now you were sitting at the couch eating dinner, watching TV. Uh -huh. Right. So then I said, okay, well, let me try something else. Mm -hmm. So I just the next day I went down, you were eating dinner. Uh -huh. But then you didn't reject me that time. <laughs> <laughs> so just you keep, keep on, on trying. Like that. I mean, <laughs> just what, keep I'm on trying. Better. But here's the deal. Man, that takes a lot of maturity. It takes a lot of. And you have to swallow a whole bunch yeah, of humble pie. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Because if your spouse is being ignorant, you're basically doing this by faith is unto the Lord. But First Peter chapter 5, I believe, or chapter 3 says that a man can be won by the lifestyle of his wife. Mm -hmm. And I would say publicly, thank you for winning me back to where I should be. Because, baby, I uh, love you, yeah. and I'm willing to fight for you. Yeah. And I was willing to fight for you back then. Well, a lot of women are willing to fight, and a lot of men are willing to fight, but they're fighting with their flesh instead of fighting yeah. with their faith. And it just so happened that God did something in your heart where he gave you spiritual weapons, mm -hmm. and then you learned how to use those spiritual weapons, mm -hmm. the full armor of God and the sword of the spirit. And you begin to call things that be not. And you stood after you have done all, but you stood mm -hmm. until God got hold of my heart. You know, my pastor used to always say it like this, that your man's heart or your woman's heart is too, um, your arms are, your too, man's short. Arms are too short to box with God. Mm -hmm. Like, and if you can live your life to where you get God involved, mm -hmm. listen, your spouse's arms are too short to box with God. Come on. But if you take matters into your own hands, God is like, okay, you got it. But if you can start living, do what you do as unto the Lord, then God's going to get involved. And that's what God did. He got involved with my heart, and I had to apologize. I mean, we probably have tons of stories like that. Yeah. Of things. I mean, it wasn't a super long period because when I came around, I came around, and then I ran with it. Yeah. I ran. I'm not that guy that you go into church and I'm sitting at home. Ain't no way. Mm -hmm. Okay. I remember the first um, church when we moved to Washington, D.C. area, you joined a church without me, mm -hmm. and you didn't know that we should do that as a couple. I came the next Sunday, and I joined it, but I didn't want to be there. And then a real estate client invited me to another church, and that's where we got, and that's where they began to teach you all of these principles. Yeah. And uh, I'm telling you, when I got hold of the place that I was supposed to be, and I could understand the Word of God, mm -hmm. you had to pray for me no more because I'm going to lead this thing all the way into the end zone. And uh, I really believe that there are men who are going to do that as well. He might be struggling right now. He might be struggling in between the world and the word of God. He might not have had an example, but um, there's greatness on the inside of him. Yeah. I would tell women, don't give up. Men, don't, don't give, give up, up on your marriage. Don't throw in the towel. Don't quit. Mm -hmm. Better days are ahead. I'm so glad that we didn't. I'm so glad that I didn't give up on well, you. Been the worst I'm so glad made. you didn't give up on me Amen. because we were searching. That's why I joined that church because I was just, I was, I, I knew our life wasn't the way that I wanted it to be, yeah. you know, but I didn't know what to do. And yeah. so like I joined the church cause I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm making steps. I, I need, yeah. you know, I need God in my life. I need help. Yeah. But the fact that you came behind me, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? And found, I could have been like, well, you go to that church and I'm going to go to this church. Right. Well, I know. And that's what I'm saying. I know everybody's situation is different mm -hmm. and some people are married to idiots, but they're still creations of God yeah. and their arms are too short to box with God. So I think the principles, mm -hmm. maybe their situation is like, well, I've been believing for my husband for five years. I ain't, I, 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 man, uh, uh, I pray the grace of God yeah. over you, the yeah. peace of God. Don't give up. Don't give up yet. Mm -hmm. Number four is this. Stop looking for an easy <coughs> way out. Stop looking for an easy out. Five keys to saving a broken marriage to stop looking for an easy out. You know, there's nothing new under the sun. Um, Satan is a master deceiver, and he's always wanting you to feel like you yeah. made a mistake. I shouldn't have married you. We got married too young. I should have married somebody else. I never should have been married. I should have stayed single. Shouldn't have had kids. I shouldn't quit school. Should have went. It's always the same thing. And I think sometimes we just got to say, devil, you are a li you're a liar. Because he lies, and we start to look for an easy way out. 
if I was married to somebody else, things would be better. No, you would take you into the new relationship. Yeah. Um, you can't, instead of looking for the grass to be greener on the other side, you can begin to water your own grass. And so um, for us, um, I think that was a big thing. We just divorced ourselves from threatening divorce mm -hmm. or using divorce as an option. I remember there would be times where I would leave the house like I ain't coming back. I ain't coming. I'm just gonna stay out here. I'm gonna drive in a circle if I got to. And I'm just, I'm just, I'm just so mad. I can't stand you. I'm not going back home. I'm just gonna stay out all night, right? Um, but I think everything changed when we took that threat off the table. And I think there's too many people that they get into a jam and they they threaten. Well, I'm leaving. Um, um, where are you going? You know, like I, I want to get a divorce. I'm going to stay with my mama. No, stay there and stop putting each other on the couch. OK, stop practicing divorce and figure out how to communicate, you know. And I know there are times where you know how you get mad at your spouse and like you in the same bed and you you sleeping on the edge of the bed. I'm talking about over where the seam of the mattress is. I can't <laughs> even stand you right now. I don't even I, I mean, I just I'm just I don't even want to look at you. Don't even share my covers with. But you got to learn to live through those things. And apologize in the morning. Yeah. Apologize at night if you really want to be biblical and not let your son go down on your raft. But you got to learn. Listen, sometimes you got to apologize. And you ain't even the one that should be apologizing. <laughs> you just need to apologize because it's drama. <laughs> Whatever. I ain't got time for that. Life is too short. It is so true. You know what I'm saying? Sometimes I'm like, baby, I'm sorry. Hey, yeah, after 24 <laughs> years of marriage, like, yeah, there's times I can speak for us both where it's just like, you're upset about something. You're upset with me about something. Look, baby, I don't even really understand, but I'm sorry. Right. Like, I, I don't want to fight with you. I'm sorry. What, what, tell me what you want me to do. Yeah. <laughs> like, and I mean it. I want the people listening to this podcast right now to stop using the word divorce Stop talking about leaving and cut the word out of the dictionary. Mm -hmm. I tell a story about a couple, the first married couple that I ever did. Their names are the Geist Whites. They had both been married before. And on their wedding day, they did a ceremony that I'd never seen since, never seen before, and never seen it since. Most people in a wedding, they have the unity candles, the unity saying. They got somebody singing Luther Vandross over in the corner. <laughs> but on their wedding day, in the middle of the ceremony, they brought out the family dictionary and they put it on a podium. And hand in hand, they walked over to some scissors. They came to the family dictionary. They turned over to the page D. They looked for the word divorce. And hand in hand, they cut the mm -hmm. word divorce out of their family dictionary. And they said, we will not use this word in our relationship. Mm -hmm. And uh, 15, 16 years later, they're still married and happy on today. And I believe that's a word for somebody who's listening today that you got to stop threatening and leaving. Yes. That's not an option, okay? You said this was till death do you part. Sickness, health. Rich, poor, we done done all that. We've been poor together, rich together. We done been sick together, on top together, but we still together. Yeah. And there's something powerful about being together. And so people come tell me, well, I think I want to leave. I think I want to get a divorce. Has there been infidelity? Okay, has there been abuse, adultery? Has there been Addiction. abandonment? If it has not been those things, mm -hmm. OK, don't come telling me about some divorce. If you ain't went through two years of counseling, if you ain't went, if you haven't read at least 100 books on marriage, if you haven't listened to at least um, 50 podcasts on marriage, if you have went to a small group for at least three years. You know, I posted a clip that says something like that. And there was somebody that said, well, you just think we have so much money to go to counseling. Oh, you ain't even ready for what I'm talking about. You talking about money. I'm talking about your marriage. I'm talking about your best friend. I'm talking about the two that has become one. I'm talking about your destiny. And you talk about money okay and it's amazing the people that won't invest up front but they rather get a divorce and you're gonna pay you're gonna pay one way or another it's just like eating okay you're either gonna eat healthy and you're gonna go to whole foods and you're gonna pay up front or you're gonna pay in the doctor's bill but you're gonna pay you're gonna pay one way or another you're either gonna wow. pay um by getting counseling or you're gonna pay by child support alimony and a broken home and broken dreams so you're gonna pay mm. so why don't we just make an investment up front to cut off some of the other stuff that we have and invest in some good counseling or find a good church get into some marriage small group and work on the ministry of marriage come on we can do it and number five last but not least is that you got to put god first if you want a key to how to heal a broken marriage mm -hmm. god is the inventor of marriage and he's the one that will give you the power do you think our marriage would have been restored without god no like what percentage chance um, would it be restored mm. first of all i don't think we would have gotten married because i wouldn't have got saved and i wouldn't have no nah. um what percentage I'm going to say a 0%. It was not working out without God. I would say a 0%. Like it's zero. If it wasn't for we God. We would not be together. We would, probably wouldn't be together. Yeah, and that's unfortunate. 
you guys, see, we, we need God. We need God. We need God. We need, a, we, need, we need a power that is bigger than ourselves because we do not know exactly mm-hmm. what we're doing. I don't care how many degrees you got. I don't care how much success you have, how much money you got in the bank. You need God. Mm-hmm. There, are some, there are some problems in the world that you do not have the answers to because there is a God. Mm-hmm. And um, I believe when you, when you give your heart to Jesus, there is an anointing, an empowerment of the Holy Spirit that will come on your life to help you with every relationship, every business deal, all of your heart's desires, everything that is involved in your marriage, he yeah. would love to be a part of it. I love you for the way that you love God. I think the number one advice that we give to married people is marry somebody who loves God more than they love you. Yeah. Because many people look for somebody to love them. Mm-hmm. But the way that I love you is only because I love God. So I submit to you because I submit to him. Yeah. I honor you because I really honor God. And I think that should be the number one quality that a believer should look for is that I'm looking for somebody who loves God more than they love me. And I think for those people who are struggling in their marriage right now, if you don't love God more than your spouse, yeah. you got to get there. You got to get to loving you God. You got to get your relationship You've made with your God spouse to be an the idol. number one thing yeah. in your life. Yeah. Because I was there. Uh-huh. I was there. I loved you more than I love God. Mm-hmm. I love because my relationship with God was new. I didn't know the word. I didn't know anything. So I made you. But happy. I know you. You yeah. made me happy. Yeah. You gave me joy. You gave me security. You mm-hmm. gave me peace. Mm-hmm. And I had to. And it was it was ungodly. Yeah. It was too much for you. You can't fill those shoes. Yeah. You Ooh. can't do that for me. That there was is too somebody much pressure on that you. is making their spouse fill shoes that only God can mm-hmm. fill, and that's too much pressure on mm-hmm. your marriage. They can never and be God. I could not love you uh-huh. the way you need to be loved mm-hmm. without God in my life. Yeah. I had to first love God, love myself, yeah. care for myself, and then I can give you the love that you deserve, yeah. the love that God created you to be able to receive. Yeah, yeah, so good, so good. And so we want to pray for your marriages because I just believe there's a ram in the bush. I just believe that if you don't quit, you don't throw in the towel, you don't give up. I believe God is at work. I believe there's more working for you than against you. If you're a believer, I believe that all things are working together for your good. God has this crazy way of taking your mess and giving you a message, taking your test like we've been through and giving you a testimony. My prayer is for those of you all who are where we used to be, that in the soon coming years, God will give you a marriage ministry just like he's given us. And I pray in Jesus' name that you will not give up, that you will have strength to endure, that you will go to God and humbly say, God, I need you. And you will sense the confirming presence of the Lord. And you will sense God moving and giving you wisdom of how he is, a, he is one who will give you beauty for ashes. He is the repairer of the breach. He wants to restore the broken things so that you give him the glory. And so we just declare the favor of God over you. We declare the restorative power of God over yes, you. Lord. We pray that God gives you wisdom. He gives you breakthrough. And he gives you this crazy ability to love the unlovely. And uh, we would love to hear your testimony about what God is doing in your relationships and how he restores it, okay? Hey, we love you guys. We're out of time for today. Thank you so much for tuning in to our podcast today and our broadcast wherever you are. Just know that you are not alone. That's right. You at least got me and her that is rooting you on. We would love to hear from you if you have a testimony. Your testimonies, they encourage us. They inspire us to want to keep going, (laughs) okay? (laughs) And so you can share it by sharing a review. We always check out our reviews because then we can see it, but other people can see what God has been doing and how he's using this podcast as well. Of course, sharing is caring and caring is sharing. Share this broadcast with friends and family members and coworkers, people who don't know God, people who do know God. There are principles on it that we believe would add great value to their life. And if you're newer to our broadcast, hit the subscribe button so you can be the first to get the content when it's released. And uh, come, if you're ever in Orlando, Florida, come join us at a live church. Okay. And so we hope to see you next week. We got some great content coming out for you next week. Um, Thank you for tuning in to Doing Life with Ken and Tabitha. We'll see you next week. Peace. Peace.